Welcome everyone to the latest installment of EMS Focus, a collaborative federal webinar series. I'm Gam Wijaytunga, Director of NHTSA's Office of EMS. Together with our federal partners, NHTSA's Office of EMS is focused on advancing a national vision for EMS. The projects we undertake and the resulting resources for the EMS community help with system improvements, measuring the health of EMS systems nationwide, and delivering the data that EMS leaders need to advance their individual systems. Another role of the office is to educate the EMS community on new innovations, processes, and technologies that can help provide improved and more efficient patient care. This free webinar series hosted by the NHTSA Office of EMS is a unique opportunity for federal EMS agencies and industry experts to share information with the EMS community. EMS Focus conducts webinars several times each year on issues that are important to the EMS community and provides you with timely information on what federal agencies are doing to address issues. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be archived on EMS.gov for future viewing. There'll be time at the end of the day's webinar for questions, but please submit your questions using the Q&A tab throughout the webinar. Next slide. For today's agenda, we'll be highlighting DOT's commitment to traffic incident management, or TIM. One of our panelists will recount a personal story involving traffic incident management and how changes were made at a local level. We'll also review the benefits of TIM training for EMS and how the Federal Highway Administration, NHTSA, and others are educating clinicians to reduce death and disability. And then we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. Joining me today in kicking off the webinar is Mark Curley, the Director of the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Transportation Operations. I'm going to share a little bit about the Office of EMS and our current efforts to promote the National Roadway Safety Strategy, addressing responder traffic incident management, and then hand it over to Mark and his team to talk more about statistics, resources, and training. The NHTSA Office of Emergency Medical Services, which also houses the National 911 program, supports the improvement of patient care in the out-of-hospital setting on a national level. We do so in three ways, bringing together available data and industry experts to identify the most critical issues facing the profession, tackling those issues through collaboration with partners, including other federal agencies and national EMS organizations, and providing awareness and education about best practices and evidence-based guidelines. The National Roadway Safety Strategy was unveiled by Secretary Pete Buttigieg in early 2022, and it provides a framework for DOT actions to reduce death and disability on our roadways. The safe system approach means that our responsibility does not end when a crash occurs. Caring for people injured in a crash to prevent their injuries from becoming fatal is just as critical. The timing of the arrival of ambulances and emergency responders is a major factor in whether an injured person survives a crash, and crash location is a major determinant of response time. Priority areas include shortening response time to enhance survivability of crashes through expedient access to emergency medical care and improving the quality of EMS data. It will also promote a safer working environment for first responders by preventing secondary crashes through robust traffic incident management practices, or TIM. Next slide, please. Between 2011 and 2020, over 370,000 people died in transportation incidents in the United States, and more than 94% of those fatalities occurred on our roadways. The National Roadway Safety Strategy uses the safe system approach to guide specific activities and post-crash care is a key element of this approach. As you see on the slide, that the SSA principles include that death and serious injuries are unacceptable, humans make mistakes, humans are vulnerable, responsibility is shared, safety is proactive, and redundancy is crucial. Our objectives under the safe system approach include safer people, safer roads, safer vehicles, safer speeds, and post-crash care. 
As I mentioned, that focuses on enhancing survivability of crashes to expedient access to emergency medical care, as well as creating a safe work environment for first responders. Next slide, please. There are three key post-crash care activities that DOT is undertaking relating to post-crash care. Improve the delivery of EMS, improve national EMS data quality, and improve on-scene safety through outreach and training. Again, our responsibility does not end when a crash occurs. Caring for people injured in a crash is just as critical. Next slide, please. The DOT has created a public website to help track activities toward the implementation of the NRSS. If you wanna learn more about these specific actions within post-crash care, please use the QR code on this slide to access the DOT's dashboard and you can check it out yourself. Next slide, please. Key to implementation of the, bipart of the NRSS is the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which included a 50% increase in original funding availability for these efforts. That's five to six billion dollars over the next five years. So we encourage participants in this webinar to talk to your state, regional, and local highway safety officials about providing technical knowledge about EMS to help implement plans for improving roadway safety. Again, when you have this conversation with your local highway safety officials, you are the post-crash care specialists, so you can provide critical information to help improve outcomes. Next slide, please. In FY22, the new Safe Streets and Roads for All program announced over $800 million in grants to 510 communities across the United States, including 473 action plan grants, which can include post-crash care. The action plan grants assist communities that do not currently have a roadway safety plan in place. So we recommend that state and local EMS and 911 offices look up local action plan recipients to inquire how you might play a role in developing these critical action plans. Go to transportation.gov backslash grants backslash SS4A to learn more. Next slide, please. NHTSA's Office of EMS commitment to responder safety goes beyond our collaboration with the Federal Highway Administration. We are also planning to collaborate with other agencies like the U.S. Fire Administration to increase awareness and knowledge about this critical topic and how we can improve responder safety on our roadways. Next slide, please. So just some upcoming deadlines uh, and why collaboration with highway safety is so important. Uh, it's not too late to reach out and talk about mutually beneficial projects and activities, including post-crash care and TIM training with your local and state highway safety officials. Next slide, please. On that note, I'd now like to turn it over to Mark Curley, Director of the FHWA Office of Transportation Operations, to introduce what he and his team are doing to promote traffic incident management and to highlight some of their key TIM strategies. Mark? Thank you, Cam. And um, before I give a very brief overview of traffic incident management, um, I want to thank you and your office for the great support and help and friendship over the years on um, advancing traffic incident management, uh, all the different disciplines, in particular the EMS discipline. Um, I've got a couple of slides um, at very high level to talk about what traffic incident management is, and then a couple of my colleagues are going to be talking more about some of the specific items that we have um, going on, in particular. Um, TIM training program and the TIM outreach program. So let me just give an overview of um, what is TIM. Um, there have been nearly 40, there were nearly 43,000 people killed in motor vehicle crashes on US roadways during 2021. That's a 10% increase from the 39,000 fatalities in 2020. The estimated number of people injured on our roadways increased in 2021 to 2.5 million people. 
rising from 2.28 million in 2020, which is a little bit over a 9% increase. The estimated number of police reported traffic crashes increased 5.2, increased from 5.25 million in 2020 to 6.1 million in 2021, a 16% increase. Each of these crashes is a hazardous situation. And every six seconds, the responder is putting his or her life at risk helping motorists on roadways. Traffic incident management is the science and practice of safely and quickly detecting, managing, and clearing all types of roadway incidents from crashes to stalled vehicles to roadway debris. Tim focuses on collaboration and coordination through training, after action reviews, sharing of data, use of technologies and tools. And the reason for our presentations today is to ask your help in making sure that the EMS community um, uses these good practices and takes advantage of all of the training and other opportunities that are available. Next slide. In the nearly 40 years that traffic incident management practice has been around, we know it works. We know that multidisciplinary TIM committees are effective at collaborating to managing incidents. We know that traffic responder training reduces secondary crashes involving responders. Some of the early data that we received, um, the Arizona Department of Public Safety was an early adopter of traffic incident management and the TIM training program. When the US DOT went to Arizona to look at crash data to see if the training had any impact on safety, they found that between 2012, when the training was first rolled out, and 2015, there was a 30% decrease in secondary crashes involving incident responders as compared to, the, as compared to before the TIM practices were in place. In Maryland, Virginia, and Oregon, they all conducted studies and found 30 to 35% reduction in the time to clear roadway incidents through TIM practices. We also know policies and legislation such as move over, authority removal, help clear incidents quickly. Enforcement to move over laws keeps our responders safe. And finally, keeping key data helps agencies understand what is working well and what can be improved. So with that, um, again, our ask is that if you're not involved in the TIM training program, you consider it. And um, hear what our folks had to say about um, the training that's been done so far and how you could be engaged in that and other forms of TIM outreach. Gam, thank you very much for inviting us to today's session and your friendship throughout the years. Thank you, Mark. Glad to have you here. Our other three panelists for today's webinars are webinar are Megan Quinn of the Glen Echo Fire Department in Montgomery County, Maryland, and two of Mark's team, Joe Tebow and Jim Ostrich uh, from the Federal Highways Office of Transportation Operations. I'll now turn it over to Megan, a 16-year veteran volunteer firefighter and EMT to share her personal experience with a roadway incident on a busy highway. Thank you for joining us today, Megan. Good afternoon, Gam, and thank you for having me here. Um, I'm excited to be able to share the story of the experience that my crew had in the hopes that it prevents this same incident happening, happening to someone else. Um, in 2015, my ambulance crew responded to what sounded like a fender bender on the shoulder of a busy multi-lane interstate highway uh, in the Washington DC area. When we got on scene, there was just a single car that had been damaged that was sitting on the side of the road. It was a busy evening. Um, there was a lot of bad weather in the area. So we were sent as a single ambulance responding to this incident. There wasn't an engine company or any other piece of heavy apparatus that was sent with us. About eight minutes after we got on scene, a drunk driver who was piloting a very large pickup truck going about 80 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone, lost control of his vehicle, spun out across all the lanes of traffic and struck the car that our patients were in. 
In the process of this, the impact ended up throwing two of the EMTs who were on my ambulance uh, a significant distance. Fortunately, um, we were able to activate additional resources and very quickly had additional responders on scene to help care for both of my injured EMTs, as well as the occupants of the vehicle that had originally been involved in just a minor fender bender, um, and ultimately some of the individuals who are also in the striking vehicle. As a result of this incident, my jurisdiction looked at and ultimately changed some of the policies and the ways that we teach about driving and responding to emergency um, incidents that are on large highways, as well as some of the policy behind how we dispatch units for those incidents. Um, originally, we were taught that EMS units should be positioned for rapid egress, so you weren't going to position your ambulance as a blocking unit in front of a scene. That's exactly how the ambulance was positioned this night because we were an ambulance, but we were also the only unit and there was no thought of using an ambulance as a blocking unit until a larger piece of apparatus could get on scene to help protect the scene more. That's something that's now changed. If the EMS unit is the first unit on scene, we are taught that the ambulance should assume a blocking position until there's a piece of heavy apparatus on board to provide more scene security. And then the EMS unit can always reposition. Additionally, at that time when there were significant call volumes um, and we were stretched thin for apparatus, responses to what sounded like minor motor vehicle collisions on large roadways was reduced to just being a single ambulance response rather than coming with a piece of heavy apparatus to provide that blocking unit. As a result of our nearly catastrophic injury the county ended up changing that policy. No matter how busy we are, no matter how taxed we are for resources, every single dispatch on a major roadway does come with both an EMS unit and a fire piece that is dedicated just for blocking and protecting the crew that's working on there. Um, of the four people who were on my ambulance crew that night, two of us have remained active volunteering in EMS. Um, one, the youngest, who was a college student at the time, was never physically able to come back to doing this um, and has some lifelong medical complications. Uh, and the third was able to return briefly and then ultimately decided that he didn't want to remain involved in a system that almost killed him while he was working for free. Uh, it's an incident that is very much still with me every single time I'm in the firehouse and responding to calls. And the one thing that the four of us agreed on very quickly after this crash happened was that it would be worth it if we were able to use our experience to ensure that it didn't happen to someone else in the future. And hopefully me talking here today do does just that. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Megan. Um, and we're, we're all grateful to have you join us today and, and help get the message out uh, to our colleagues in the field about improving safety. Really appreciate it. Um, I'd now like to turn it over to Joe Tebow from the Federal Highway Administration, who is also a 44-year veteran volunteer firefighter and command officer and ALS clinician in Maryland. Joe? Thanks, Gam. Uh, thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks, Megan, for, your, for, for sharing your story, and all too familiar story across the nation. Um, as I said, I, I'm Joe Tebow, Federal Highway Administration, uh, Traffic Incident Management Team. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit more about what uh, Gam had uh, mentioned earlier. Um, in, in the last two years, it's the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law that I'm sure you've all heard of, and the NRSS has, has renewed their focus on Tim and safety. Um, most notably, the, uh, the National Roadway Safety Strategy focused on post-crash care for EMS. It's a central component of the NRS, as NRSS. Uh, traffic incident management, right, is, is an element of all five of NRSS objectives, right? We're, we're in there somewhere, uh, everywhere you look, um, uh, but most significant within post-crash care objective. Uh, and, and the TIM program has two action items. 
from the NRSS. Um, the first one being to develop and implement an, an outreach plan for EMS uh, and directly uh, related to on-scene safety. And the other is to advance TIM training uh, and technologies uh, targeted at uh, responder training with EMS included. Uh, and, and motorist safety uh, is included in that too. But I'm going to focus on, on that first bullet that I mentioned. Um, the, the second one's actually a part of our uh, Federal Highways Everyday Counts innovation, uh, Next Generation TIM. Uh, this innovation uh, focuses on technologies for saving lives. Uh, very interesting. Go to our website, check it out if, if you get the opportunity. Um, if you need to know more about the bill, as we call it, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, um, you can you can find it, you know, online, and uh, it's uh, there. And basically, uh, starts at uh, twenty four one o five, I think it is section. Yeah, twenty four one o five, uh, and and you can uh, read that tonight as you're preparing for bed. Next slide, please. Yeah. So. Uh, I mentioned that the uh, the, the outreach plan, right, uh, um, and and we have it in the draft form, right. We're we're moving quickly on it, um, but we we came out of there with with some uh, objectives and some objectives that were assigned to us, if you would, um, but, but but we customized them. And and uh, first objective is to increase the number of uh, state EMS offices to engage directly with their counterpart statewide TIM committees. Every state has a TIM committee. Um, so what we're going to do there is deliver joint customized emails uh, from, from the Federal Highway TIM team and the SEMSA, right, uh, to each state EMS official and, and give them the overview of, uh, of TIM and our focus on EMS. Um, we're also going to deliver a presentation on TIM and uh, responder safety training uh, at the five NASEMSA regional meetings um, occurring this year in 2023. Um, and th then then deliver the briefing in, in like a week and a half. We're going to deliver a briefing uh, to Nesemso's uh, at Nesemso's uh, annual meeting, uh, which is June 11th through uh, 15th in Reno. Um, so we'll be able to get in front of all those folks and, uh, and 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 beat the traffic incident management drum and and let everyone know how you know how our what our approach is and to get their input input for sure. So the the second objective. Right, it's all about Tim training, right? For for every life on the line, right? When responding to roadway incidents, so the outreach plan is going to target EMS publications. You all pretty familiar with who the popular publications are. We're going to target the uh, electronic and print publications, um, and, and talk about Tim and national Tim responder training. Uh, we're going to draft brief articles um for ems related newsletters and other publications on traffic incident management and national tim responder training we're going to include social media templates and national associations can brand them and share um, we're going to customize and submit articles and support um, the publication process um, and and that that's you know a, a key key point too that you folks out there that whatever challenges you you have whatever lessons you've learned please share them with us um, we, 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 we'd love to, to hear your story and uh, maybe even uh, give us permission to, to share them with the, 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 the rest of the EMS community. Uh, we're going to target the mat, uh, major national private EMS agencies for training. Right? And you know, some people might say, oh, what? what? Well, we, we know that across the nation, you know, there's a, a trend of third party EMS agencies uh, coming in to either do primary care or maybe just transport services, but either way, find themselves suddenly at the scene of a crash, uh, and, and they need to have the training. They need to know where they fall in line, you know, what their roles and responsibilities are. So we're going to give some focus to the to, to the top five um, private slash for profit EMS agencies, um, and and then you know we're going to email them, contact them, reach out to them, uh, get a brief virtual meeting with them and, and then uh, their education and training teams and encourage them to uh, take advantage of the traffic incident management training. Um, we can even help them, you know, make that happen. Um, we're going to do the follow-up email with all these agencies to see uh, whether uh, their policies uh, include TIM response-related training. 
Um, so, you know, just reach out and, and, and bring it to the forefront. So the focus is on grassroots outreach. Um, we need to find those local organizations and their points of contact because we know how diversified the EMS discipline uh, profession is across the nation. Um, they're not, not all ambulances roll out of firehouses. You know, we understand that. We recognize that. Um, our, our third objective is to, to increase the EMS training uh, entities offering TIM training. So what we call that is institutionalization of the TIM training program. And there's we, we, we've heard many different ways uh, that, that, that uh, that's already been done. Um, the state of Georgia, for instance, um, has, requires TIM training in their uh, EMT uh, uh, program. Um, and others are using uh, the TIM four-hour certificate as a prerequisite in order to just apply to become an EMT. So there, there's different strategies out there for it. Um, but when we talk about uh, offering the TIM training and, and the institutionalization, I'm going to take this and I'm going to pass this over to my colleague, Jim Ostrich, uh, who, who who's, keeps his thumb on the pulse of TIM training for federal highway and across the nation. Uh, so with that, uh, you know, uh, as Gammon mentioned, you know, please use the uh, the Q and A uh, pod there to to fire off any questions you may have. Reach out to us; we're here to help you all the way. And with that, I'll say, Jim Ostrich, it's all yours, buddy. Thanks, Joe. Can you hear me? I hear you. Okay, brother. Thank you. Turned on my video. Okay. Don't know what's wrong with my video. But that's okay. Um, uh, it's an honor. My name is Jim Ostridge. I'm one of three program managers out of the Office of Transportation Operations at Federal Highway. Uh, the, the National TIM Program Office. Uh, our colleague, uh, Paul Joden's with us today, although he's not presenting. Uh, and uh, we, we've been uh, looking forward uh, to uh, greatly increase our, our uh, work together with the Office of EMS, uh, NHTSA's Office of EMS. Uh, Mark mentioned, uh, mentioned that we have been working for a number of years uh, and it's just an honor uh, now to take it to another level. Uh, so we we definitely thank all of you, and certainly thank uh, Gam and Dave Bryson and the uh, the uh, the team here. So what you you heard Joe mention institutionalization, the National Tim Responder Training. So what is it? Tim Tim is basically a safety program of. Uh, and, and so Tim occurs on all roadways. For a, for a long time there, we were focused on traffic incident management, collisions, crashes, wrecks, and other traffic incidents on interstates, freeways, highway, uh, high-speed facilities. But the fact of the matter is crashes happen everywhere, right? We all know that. Rural, remote, urban, uh, day and night, they, they never stop. So uh, we're we're engaged to save lives with this training program. So it was developed, as you see here, by responders for responders back just prior to 2012, uh, uh, a series of professionals, both from the responder community and engineering, uh, uh, formed a, a group that developed this training that was finally launched in the summer of 2012. And um, it took off. It, it really did. It took off. It actually, you know, exploded and, and, and exceeded our expectations. So our, our team has been running with it ever since. And I will tell you that as of the 22nd of this month, we, we have trained 600 and over 649,000 responders. That's combined police, fire, rescue, EMS, towing, recovery, transportation, and public works and other personnel. But today we're here focusing on our brothers and sisters in the EMS community. Um, it's so important um, 
and and you all know, and as Megan said, you know, shared with her incident, you know, the dangers that exist out there, the risk. Uh, but I will say we are definitely out to train well over a million responders. And as Joe said, again, institutionalize the training. Uh, and uh, I'll share a little bit more on how you, you can access the training uh, as well. Joe also mentioned Georgia. Uh, and I'll add Kentucky, both of those states uh, not too long ago uh, through their Department of Health, uh, and, and, and this is one of our asks to you, uh, please please try to do the same thing, to require the TIM training as part of, part of your uh, uh, continuing education requirements, uh, CEs uh, for licensing, relicensing, that's that's a big ask of our, our of our office, and as you heard Joe said, you're going to see him traveling the country, country, and Paul, uh, Joe, and I through other you know through venues like this to continue to spread the word um, and save lives. Next next slide. So I I said you know how how can you reach this training? So for the majority of you or most folks, those that cannot reach an in-person class, that first bullet. Uh, ideally, it's the best way to get this training, just like it's the best way to get receive any training, to, to be honest. Uh, but in every state, all 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, we have contacts, point of contacts, which is that URL there. Feel free to click on it and search for your state and reach out to those individuals uh, to find out what in-class sessions uh, they have planned. Uh, I failed to mention that the class, the training first was launched as a four-hour course. Um, and uh, shortly thereafter, we launched an e-learning or web-based version of the same exact course, which is the second uh, and, and third bullets, uh, or I should say URLs that you see here. So, easy to access, free of cost to you. And uh, once you go through, pass the, the knowledge check and the exam, you can print your certificate and you'll be on your way. The Emergency Responder Safety Institute, the, the, the second bullet uh, there that you see, uh, that was a collaboration again uh, with IRSI and respondersafety.com, where we uh, compared 10 of their modules, which are approximately an hour, most of them are less, uh, and compared it to the national curriculum. And uh, we blessed it, and ever, we've been in collaboration with IRSI ever since then. Uh, so that course is free as well. And you see here, there's a refresher curriculum that we're in the midst of, uh, of developing as we speak, should be launched at the end of the year. And there's also technology and rural TIM lessons uh, that will be available uh, through the National Highway Institute. Uh, as I mentioned above, uh, the National Highway Institute being the training arm for FHWA, uh, if, if you didn't know. Next slide. So I mentioned certificate. Well, uh, and, and I believe uh, you may have already heard uh, this and, and maybe even taken the course uh, through, through the National Highway Institute and printed this, this certificate. Super important. This, this, this is this uh, collaboration with the Commission on Accreditation for Pre-Hospital Continuing Education, CAPSI, our friends at CAPSI, again, that a collaboration that we felt was important to help you paramedics and EMTs and others in the EMS world um, to, to take this course and submit for, um, for CEUs. So take advantage of this. Right now, the, the uh, accreditation, um, uh, organizational accreditation, I should say, is being reestablished with CAPSI because it, it expired. However, don't let that uh, deter you. Go online at NHI. You can search that course number 133126A and just register. Again, it's free of charge and you can take the uh, four-hour course online. 
print your certificate and submit it to your health department or licensing uh, agency in your state jurisdiction. Next slide. So the, again, referencing uh, the institutionalization, it's actually up to over 180 law enforcement, fire, EMS, public safety academies across our country that have adopted the TIM training uh, uh, for new recruits, new, new cadets. And this is a big deal. We have a long way to go. Obviously, every state's different in, in terms of how many academies are, are teaching the the uh, four-hour TIM curriculum. Uh, some In some cases, it's tech colleges. But uh, when you talk to uh, any anyone from that point of contacts list that I mentioned earlier, that URL, uh, you can you can ask them. Uh, actually, you can ask them any question you want, but certainly uh, uh, be in the know and and we're, are asked to you as as Joe said and even Mark, I believe, we're trying to help spread the word of traffic incident management training. Uh, to the responder community. Too many of us are being struck and killed by what we call the D drivers, the drunks, the drowsy, the distracted, the drugged, or just plain dangerous. And so you, ha you have to keep your head on a swivel uh, and, and watch each other's backs. Next slide. Here you see the proof. I you know, we're short on the EMS community. You can see this, this bar chart. This is a report that comes out every couple of weeks. If anybody's interested in, in receiving the National TIM Training Status Report and MAPS, uh, please send Paul, Joe, or myself an email and we'll get your, your name on the distribution list. But again, the EMS community is who we're focusing on here. Uh, and it's so important. We want to help you uh, and certainly ensure that you get to go home every night as well. Next slide, please. So I've already said this. Uh, please, we're asking you to help us help our community nationally. You heard Mark Curley, our boss, mention the statistics. Of, of fatalities, uh, crashes, and in GAM as well. Uh, things are not better. We can never give up, that's for sure. Uh, and there's one example here from Houston Fire, Captain uh, Bear Wilson uh, from Houston Fire Department, who's been a champion as well, shared this statistic here uh, not too, too long ago. Uh, and they're doing great things. And actually, actually, Bear is a double duty. He's actually a constable as well uh, in the state of Texas. So he he's both a firefighter, uh, EMT, as well as uh, law enforcement. Next slide. So just quick mention, if you're not aware, CRSW, what's that? Well, it's the week, the second week in November, where we commemorate and honor our responder community. Uh, and so uh, we, we do a lot of activities, uh, uh, marketing and communication activities. We know NHTSA does as well. And our other sister administrations, Federal Motor Carrier, for example, and uh, proclamations have been signed by uh, 20 governors and we're seeking to get all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico. So you see there uh, URL at the bottom, if you're interested, uh, go on and see all the other resources and information regarding Crash Responder Safety Week. And with that, here's our contact information, I believe, or is, am I going back to you, Gam? Yeah, I believe so. I thought we had a contact. Uh, Oh, okay. Q and A. Q and A. Yeah, uh, we'll have we'll actually have contact information um, on the the last slide at the at the end of the webinar for for all of us. Um, so uh, we do have uh, time for some some Q and A now. Um, if anyone has any questions for our panelists, uh, please submit them through the webinar's Q and A tab that should be at the bottom of your screen. 
Um, and again, we'll, we'll also put up the contact inform information for all our panelists on the uh, final slide after we're done with uh, Q&A. Um, uh, our lead in the Office of EMS for, for safety, uh, uh, Dave Bryson, uh, is going to be assisting with moderating the, uh, the questions today. So why don't I hand things over to Dave? Thank you very much, Cam, and good job to all the panelists. Uh, there's a general comment from a couple of folks that have popped up about some of the Tim URLs are not quite working correctly. Uh, and there's a little bit of a debate going on as to whether they're working or not. Uh, this will be, as was mentioned before, posted on EMS.gov. And we will go back through with the contractor and our partners of Federal Highway to make sure that all the links are working. So uh, since that was just a general comment, uh, we hear folks and we promise to look at that and do something about it. This first question is for you, Cam. Um, it comes from David Harden. Does the Office of EMS anticipate in the near future a similar bill content that will include an established EMS funding category or section with a set percentage of allocated funding to cover EMS and trauma registries management, training, equipment, and other programmatic activities. Uh, thank you, David, for your for your for your question. And so let me let me start uh, broad first. Um, you know. So in 2021 alone, uh, 42,939 people died in traffic crashes in the United States. And we know that 40% uh, of those victims were alive when uh, responders first arrived on the scene, but ultimately died from their injuries. So the burden of pro providing good post-crash care in the United States is significant and just vitally important. And we're trying to make sure that we get that message out to all our partners as we engage in the safe system approach. Our goal as a department, uh, of, uh, as the Department of Transportation under the National Roadway Safety Strategy is to move towards zero deaths and zero injuries on our roadways. So it's gonna require everyone um, across all sectors to collaborate uh, in order to reach that goal. Uh, you mentioned bill, which is the bipartisan infrastructure law, which resulted in an approximately 50% increase in funding for highway safety across the board. It's a historic levels of funding, billions of dollars. And again, our goal is to, is to use those funds to move towards eliminating fatalities. Part of the requirements under the bipartisan infrastructure law is when states are applying for highway safety funds through NHTSA, they required their state highway safety officers are now required to submit what are called triennial highway safety plans or three-year highway safety plans to NHTSA as part of their grant application process. This is a new requirement in addition to their annual highway safety grant applications. Um, so uh, what I urge uh, particularly folks at the state level to do, uh, state EMS and 911 officers to do, is to reach out to their state highway safety officer and be closely involved in that highway safety planning process. Um, uh, so just to give you a sense of the, the, the importance of this, your state highway safety officer might not know that nationally in 2022, there were nearly 9,000 partial or complete ejections from motor vehicles, and that there were over 167,000 serious crash injuries that EMS treated in 2022 alone. That, that highway safety officer might not, might not know the important role of EMS in 911 in providing timely on-scene care, in transporting patients to trauma center using the American College of Surgeon guidelines and the, the role of EMS data in performance measurement. So there's a big opportunity for a conversation with your state highway safety officer as they're developing those highway safety plans that help direct the substantial uh, infrastructure law funding towards highway safety. And that's only part of the picture. We you know, also mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant program, which is a brand new grant program administered by the Federal Highway Administration, providing over $1 billion a year 
through 2026 uh, directly to local tribal and regional government organizations. And again, post-crash care is part of this approach to improving um, safety. So between now and 2026, um, substantial funding will be invested in this area and post-crash care clearly is, uh, as we and our partners have said in this webinar, is a priority. Um, what happens after 2026, we, we don't know. Ultimately, those decisions are, are up to Congress, but there is funding available now, and we encourage our state and local EMS partners to start having th these conversations about post-crash care with your state and local highway safety officials. Uh, now, now is the time. Again, a historic opportunity. Uh, thank you for the question, David. Very good. Thank you, Gail. Another question that I believe would be directed to Jim or any other partners in the uh, Federal Highway Office of Transportation Operations. Uh, the four-hour basic TIM course uh, was once and soon will be CAPSI approved. Uh, is the TIM train the trainer course also CAPSI approved? Thank you for the question. And the answer is it will be. Uh, along with the in-person and the web-based, uh, the train to trainer will be included this time around, as will the instructor-led, the ILVT, the instructor-led virtual training, uh, which we will be launching as well later uh, this year. I hope I was heard there, Dave. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Jim, for that answer. My video is not working. I don't know what's wrong, but thank you. We can see you and you look great. So thank you. Oh, you can see me. Okay. <laughs> yes, we can all see you, I believe. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Uh, this next question uh, could be for any of the panelists. Uh, have any states or localities had success in having their local news media complete ride-alongs um, to witness the stroke by hazards uh, or and the Tim first responder encounters followed by any media promoting Tim or the move over laws uh, and help to encourage Tim training and motorist awareness promotion. Uh, have any states talked about that? Uh, I'm at living here a little bit on the CRSW meetings or on the Tim conference calls. I'll, I'll jump on momentarily, Dave. Um, Thank you, Jeff. I, I know that um, I'm aware of several um, um, states uh, and e even, you know, be, aside from states, county agencies that, that, that have collaborated with local news media um, to, to show some of the hazards that, that folks are exposed to out there. And, and, and my recollection is it's usually around the crash responder safety week time frame, right? To, to try to uh, get that message out there. Um, but it's a message we need to get out there all year long, right? Um, so take we need to take advantage of that. They'll usually, they're usually very, you know, anxious to do that kind of stuff, you know, but, you know, each individual department has their own issues to deal with. There can be liability issues and other things. But uh, I, I do know some folks that have done that, and, and it certainly did get the message out. However, I think the flame kind of flickers to a dull glow, you know, once crash responder safety week is over and until the, the next unfortunate incident. Um, so there needs to be more of it. And I'm all for, you know, the, the outreach, whether, you know, it's it's live media or the six o'clock news or whatever the case may be. Um, as far as success goes, I, I, I don't I, I don't know if I can actually, you know, say what success, you know, they had besides, uh, you know, that, uh, that that time frame of awareness that they were able to put out there um, so that, you know, that's best I can do unless Jim or uh, or someone else knows of something more. Yeah, Joe, and I apologize. I'm having technical difficulties. Um audio as well. So I hope you can hear me now. Uh, it's a great question and, and Joe's correct. 
Um, but what we have seen over the years is a decline uh, in uh, media, uh, hard media, what I, what I call, you know, uh, actual, you know, contact uh, with responders and, and, you know, at crash scenes, doing ride-alongs, uh, things that were more uh, commonplace years ago. Uh, with the advent of social media, you know, I will say that uh, our team is constantly asking or, or suggesting to our state partners uh, to, to promote uh, not only the training and the wider, broader TIM programs, but uh, the issue of struck buys and, um, it, you know, it's just something that, that there's not enough of. Uh, I wish it was it was being you know promoted and and these kinds of activities between media uh, and 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 the public and the responder community more were more were more uh, common uh, today. As Joe said, our public affairs offices we have to be we 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 collaborate with our public affairs offices, PIOs and whatnot, but. Uh, there's uh, competing priorities and so on. But that's a very good question and one that we should all take note about and, and do, do a better job. And like Joe said, not just during crash responder safety week. It should be every day of the week, actually. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate that. Uh, another person asked after saying hello and thanking everybody for their time and presentations, uh, have there been any discussions about making this material a requirement, at least for the initial National Registry of EMT certification? Uh, and perhaps Joe, Jim, maybe even Mark, uh, maybe a discussion about how you have an executive leadership group uh, that comes together and discusses these very issues, uh, particularly with EMS folks and leadership that are in the room. Any thoughts on that, gentlemen? Joe, you want to take it first? Well, I, I can. I, I, I express my thoughts. <laughs> um, you, you know, it's... Um, it's it's a matter of uh, it's a local choice, so to speak, right? When we talk institutionalization, there are state, uh, as you know, there there are state academies where everyone goes, regardless of what county you're from, and then their individual counties, you know, have some have the luxury of having their own academies, and you know, some of the things that I've heard, some of the responses, is, well, you know what. Our, our time allotted to run this course in the academy uh, is X amount of hours. And, you know, that's what our budget, that's what we're budgeted for. So anything that we add to that usually requires something to be taken out and, and to make room for it. And we, we don't have that luxury. So that's what, you know, that's kind of like a common response. And that's why I'm the big fan of come when, when you come to the table come with your four-hour tim certificate as a prerequisite and we'll, we can roll from there that that that's you know that that's my my opinion on that you know and i i know it works because some are doing it um but um you, you know making it a requirement for initial yeah i mean it it, it should be there because you just don't know where you're going to wind up you know you just don't know and, and if you're going to be a player there at the scene, you know, if you're if you're a player, you, you should be on board as much, if not more, than the person next to you. Um, so, you know, I'm a huge fan of that. Jim? Thank you, Thank you Joe. Um, I think I would also add, if I have the, could take the prerogative uh, that I believe we talked about or was mentioned in Jim's presentation, two states. Uh, that are already requiring it. So there, uh, whether the registry or others did, that's already a big plus. And I believe Jim was promoting how great it would be for other state EMS offices and agencies to require it. Uh, and of course, it could always be asked to the registry. Jim, did you have anything to add there in the few moments? Yeah, 
Yeah, uh, Dave, thank you. The The state of Texas was actually one of the first, if not the first, through the Commission on Fire Protection uh, and the state fire marshals uh, that required the TIM training uh, for, for the firefighter EMS community in the state. And, and so shortly thereafter is uh, when uh, Georgia and Kentucky followed suit. But we just, it, it's kind of dropped and, and that hasn't happened uh, again that we're aware of. So I, we welcome all of you, if, if, you're, if you have the influence, or as our boss like to say, your sphere of influence is such that you can make that happen in your state. We're, we stand ready to support you and, and we can share documents uh, and that kind of thing. But uh, certainly, in, and, and there can be a, a deadline, like the, I know the Commission on Fire Protection in, in Texas uh, gave like a year uh, uh, period for uh, the fire community, EMS community to take, uh, take the TIM training. And by the way, the, uh, the Texas Department of Public Safety required the training as well for, for all law enforcement. Uh, so that's a big deal. Thanks, Dave. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, Cam, I think in the interest of time with four minutes left, if you want to share the next slide with the contact info and close us out, uh, I believe we can also respond to some of these questions offline uh, and yeah. make sure we have responses to those uh, when we do post it on EMS.gov. Thank you very right. much. Thanks, Dave, and thank you for moderating the, the Q&A session. Um, so as promised, here's uh, contact information for today's panelists. Uh, should you have any additional questions, we're happy to uh, to receive those and, uh, you know, really help you all in, in making our, uh, in our community safer. Next slide, please. So uh, a thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today, and um, we'd like to thank all of you for uh, participating. Uh, this webinar, along with all our past EMS-focused webinars, will be posted on EMS.gov very soon. Um, please stay safe, uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and this concludes today's webinar. <laughs>